you only need to watch any fucking episode to realize that Cowboy Bebop can be quite a depressing show. At the flick of a switch, the tone of a scene can immediately change into one filled with an overwhelming sense of depression, solitude, and bittersweet catharsis. My favorite example of this is when Ed and Ayn, two members of the Bebop crew that I initially had disdain for, finally left. When you see Ed handing that pinwheel to Spike, Ayn leaving the Bebop ship in a hurry, and Jet cheerfully preparing dinner, only to be met with a silent response and no one to be seen. Juxtaposed with Faye's crushing realisation that there's no way to regain the life she once had, and no home to return to, you gradually begin to realise that something tragic is happening. Only for it to finally hit you and break your heart when you see Ed's ridiculously graffitied farewell message with Jet and Spike just silently staring at it. Then in the next scene you see them both aggressively eating the countless eggs Jet prepared for everyone to feel the emotional pain they were feeling at the time, with the song Cool Me Cool Me playing in the fucking background as Ed and I start their new journey walking away in the sunset represented by two shooting stars appearing in the background portraying the progressive turning points of their lives and Death's return to the Bebop crew again and it just fucking breaks. <sighs> Basically, you really don't know what you have until it's gone. Which highlights one of the major themes of the show that director Watanabe once described as the things that cannot last. The tragic beauty of Cowboy Bebop is that this is not only true for every cast member, but in my experience, the viewer themselves as well. Look, Cowboy Bebop is a fucking melting pot of genres that amalgamates into this unique creation that has stood the test of time for just over 20 years as of this video. There's a reason why people still love this show today, because every time you rewatch it as you grow older into adulthood, you gain an entirely new perspective on what it's about. And what I got out of it was a story that encapsulated the pursuit for self-liberation from the past, and a life of stagnation. Every character is searching for meaning in their own respective ways, but is shackled by the past. And whilst you can interpret the show as just a character-driven story about a group of bounty hunters filled with comedic adventures, engaging fights, and moments of wholesomeness, it can also be interpreted in a much more tragic light. A light that illuminates the fundamental flaws of the main cast, and the similar but dystopian future they live in. The prevalent theme of Cowboy Bebop is the notion of being unable to escape from your own past. It begs the crucial question of, can we even have a future if we can't accept the past? no matter how tragic it may be. Each member of the core cast is unable to move beyond a particular moment in time where an event occurred because it is forever embedded within them. These are people who are frozen in time. And the answer Cowboy Bebop gives us is that in order to progress your life, you must face up to the past, accept it, and carry that weight of hardships as we are who we are because of the past experiences we've been through. It reinforces the message that there's never a point where it's too late to turn back, to reconcile and to try and make your actions right and your life better. It may be difficult, it may be hard for others to accept, but it is always possible. This core theme results in somber realizations, sad departures, and most of all, a tragic ending. So let's talk about the bittersweet tragedy of <coughs> my fucking life. <coughs> Cowboy people. Okay, three, two, one, let's jam. As anyone who's watched the show would know, the Bebop crew is a cluster of people from random backgrounds, with their only common denominator being the shattered past they can't and won't reconcile with. They survive for the sake of living another day by collecting bounties, and all have a unifying desire for purpose, but an inability to actually move forward. Each character is neglecting their previous identity. Faye has no recollection of her younger self, Jet is no longer an honor and duty bound member of the ISSP, and Spike is no longer a ruthless member of the Syndicate. They are all missing an integral part of themselves, and are consumed by the idea of obtaining an ever-so-needed closure. As a result, their time is metaphorically frozen, and the only way for the ice to melt is for the past to be dealt. 
with. Fuck, that almost rhymed. Hence, the story is all about being static. A point in life where they drift amongst the stars in the emptiness of space with no true destination in sight. The main trio have countless similarities between them. They've all experienced trauma, heartbreak, and betrayal in their past lives, leading to cynical worldviews and an isolated experience as bounty hunters teethering on the edge of society. Their lifestyle is dependent on whether there are bounties available or not, and even so, these missions only act as temporary distractions from their otherwise monotonous lives. Whilst they all inherently value the freedom their lifestyle enables them, the irony of the situation is that they themselves aren't actually free for the majority of the story. The beauty of Cowboy Bebop is watching these characters undergo this journey of self-liberation, and watching the dynamics of the main crew change as they all become more emotionally attached and open with each other. But dealing with the past issues to get the closure they yearn for to finally live in the present doesn't mean all their problems are wrapped up nicely with nothing to worry about. In fact, the end of the show makes it apparent that there are grave consequences for doing so. Spike dies, Faye undergoes an identity crisis and is left isolated, and Jet is still aimlessly living the life of a bounty hunter after losing all the meaningful relationships he had. Whilst tying up the loose ends that have been holding them back it gives them a necessary catharsis, it also means they now have to live the remainder of their lives with a massive burden on their shoulders. And to paraphrase, carry that weight. Now, I think it's worth actually looking at and examining the paths of each member of the Bebop crew, their individual journeys of self-liberation, and how it affected their future. By analysing the past, present, and future of the core cast, we can find the parallels surrounding each member, and contextualise the tragic themes the show puts forward. Jet, also nicknamed as Running Rock, has experienced betrayal from everything he held close to him. Despite his nickname adequately describing his bulky physique, he is also the most stable and reliable character in the crew, hence why he's sort of their leader figure. He grew up with strong morals and an affinity for duty and justice, which is what makes the betrayal of both his long-term partner Alyssa leaving him, and the corruption of the ISSP causing him to lose his left arm, emotionally cut him to the core. It can be interpreted by the quote, That Jet simply wanted to live a life of stability, living firmly in one place, much like a rock. But his freelancing job as a bounty hunter seems to contradict his true nature, as if he's running away from the lifestyle he actually desires, hence running rock. He's an example of a character who detests his past identity because of the trauma it brought him. It's only when Jet meets Alyssa again that he can no longer neglect his past. He hands her the broken stopwatch she left him back when she ran away, where its time has, uh, literally stopped. <laughs> Remind you of anyone? And it's only after he can confronts his past and settles his ties by finding out why Alyssa truly left him, and the real reason why he lost his left arm, that he could finally move forward. He throws away the broken stopwatch, and as a result, his frozen time starts moving again. I feel like this is the best metaphor the show brings to showcase that Jet has not only faced his past, but has accepted it and gained the necessary catharsis to finally move forward. Like the other members of the crew that I'll talk about later, he doesn't really get a happy ending. Alyssa is arguably in a worse state than how she was when she initially left, and Jet was forced to kill his old partner that he trusted so dearly, and even considered teaming up again with in the future. However, I feel like in the end Jet at least got the most closure compared to the others. He still lives his life as a bounty hunter with no long-term goals, but at the very least his time can finally move forward. And even though it's bittersweet, that has to count for something. Faye is by far the most cynical character in the series, most likely because of her experiences of being betrayed by con artists when she woke up, and her momentous debt that she has to live with. She is unique in the fact that she is the only character shown whose desire is to run directly to her past. She's missing almost all her identity, and is forced to live in a future dystopian world where the odds are metaphorically and, if you count her betting habits, literally against her. It's especially sad when she does receive glimpses of her past 
life, such as the VHS tape in Session 18, Speak Like a Child. We see Faye looking at her younger self, which puts things in a bolder perspective for her. She is no longer the person she once was. The cheerful, optimistic Faye from the past is juxtaposed with the cynical, debt-heavy and betrayed Faye of the present. She's lost her original identity. And whilst at the end of the story she does receive the answers she was looking for, there's a sad futility to it all. Whilst it was good in the fact that she was no longer chained by the past, it's reinforced the bittersweet theme of the show that nothing lasts forever. Her old home is gone, everyone she knew is either dead or elderly, and the scene at the end of session 24 reinforces her cruel isolation. However, whilst her old life may be gone, through her journey of self-discovery, she's created a new one with the Bebop crew, which seems great, but unfortunately is made all the more tragic when even that crumbles away at the end of the story, when Spike leaves. She has practically nowhere else to call home, and the closest connections she's made are with the Bebop crew, and her dependence on these relationships she's made throughout the story really make you understand why she was so heartbroken to see Spike like leave, and this last shot of her breaking down as she's failed to grasp onto the last chance of hope she had really does reinforce the bittersweet nature of the show. I thought it would be worth mentioning Ed and Ayn, as they are in no way shackled by the past to the same extent as the other members are, but I believe their role is still important in the story as they provide the necessary levity and optimism needed to lighten the mood in the darkest of times. They are both kind of a fucking enigma, but in my opinion act as a valuable conduit in emotionally opening up the crew. Jet, Spike and Faye are all emotionally frozen, <coughs> with Faye literally being fucking frozen, <coughs> and Ed and I grab gradually break down their reserved attitudes with their countless antics. Ed's childlike innocence makes her unique in the fact that she's the only member truly living in the present, and while she does have the emotional baggage of her father pretty much, well, abandoning her, she was never running away from the past like the others were. She was simply on an adventure, excited to see where her new path would lead her, and the people she'd find. And her conclusion is fitting as she eventually finds her father and decides to walk her own path in life of Ayn. Not because anyone forced her to, but out of her own choice instead. Which ends her character arc perfectly. Now of course, when talking about the tragic philosophy of Cowboy Bebop, I had to save our favourite apathetic, relaxed, witty, lazy, reckless, versatile, stylish, Bruce Lee inspired space cowboy, Spike Spiegel last. His past is a tragic one, and as a viewer we're only given fragments of it, and left to fill in the pieces. From what the show tells us, Spike was initially a member of a crime syndicate named the Red Dragons, and was believed to be one of the best enforcers around, even surpassing Vicious. When he met Julia, his priorities in life changed as he finally found someone to value and fight for, rather than just himself. I saw. He valued her so much that he wanted to run away and start a new life together, but leaving the syndicate isn't that easy. Julia doesn't show up, and Spike is left alone to cut ties with the syndicate permanently. This results in a violent last stand where it's believed Spike died, therefore giving him the perfect exit. As a result, Spike himself believes a part of him died that day, and he enters a never-ending dream that he can't escape from. He perfectly personifies Bruce Lee's philosophy of being like water, as he is shown to be pretty much adaptable to any situation thrown at him. One infamous example being when he was on a spaceship headed to his death and casually whipped out a cigarette and uttered the phrase, I'm sure a lot of people are envious of his ability to just go with the flow in any scenario and just, well, not really give up. <laughs> And whilst this has led to evidently impressive skills in combat and adaptability, I honestly believe this stylish persona is more of a facade and can be interpreted in a more sombre light that reveals his fundamental flaw as a person. The real Spike is completely apathetic. As a bounty hunter, the smallest margin of error can result in death, but this literally never phases him as there are countless examples of him undergoing borderline suicidal missions and taking on impossible tasks. So, 
これって難しい？難しいどころの話じゃないそんなの無理だバットも持たずに野球をやるようなもんだおいスパイクそういうのが好きなんだよ俺は His continuous contemplation of whether he is truly awake or in a dream results in him viewing life and death as one in the same. The parts of his identity as a member of the syndicate has already died, resulting in a shell of a man who disassociates himself from reality. A man who's uninterested from any wide ambition or glory, attaining purpose, and most importantly, progression. The entire point of his character is that he's static. And this life of stagnation, procrastination, and passiveness from facing his problems mean that the troubles of the past inevitably catch up to him. Like a shadow looming in the background, the longer he waits and the further he goes to escape his troubles, the more dangerous things become. Notice that the only times the main overarching plot of the story moves forward is when Vicious directly intervenes. And not of Spike's own volition. There have been arguments that Spike was a man who only continued to live after leaving the syndicate in the hopes that he could once again run away with Julia. Therefore, in the face of that, his life as a member of the Bebop crew was meaningless in comparison, as he was simply living day by day until he could finally reunite with his lover, the only person in the world who could rid him of his apathy. With her eventual death, the last straw was broken. The minuscule amount of meaning and will he had to stay alive in the first place was gone, hence why he went on a death mission to face the syndicate by himself. Julia was <laughs> finished. I'll be However, I disagree with this interpretation that Spike's time on the Bebop was meaningless or that he entirely lost the will to live after Julia's death. I feel like it was slightly more, well, complicated than that. The tragedy of the situation is that he had much more to live for besides from Julia. Spike had already formed unbreakable connections with every other member. This is made apparent when Spike plants that pinwheel Ed gave him on the front of the ship after she left, or emotionally opening up to Faye in session 26, or when the show makes it clear that he was far closer to Jet than he ever was to Julia. So, why did he face the syndicates by himself? <laughs> In the final episodes, the troubles of both the past and the present converge into a spectacular finale, and this line shows how Spike has finally changed as a person. He finally no longer becomes static and awakens from his dream. Instead of living a life of passiveness, running away from his past troubles, this is the first time in the series where Spike refuses to be static and actually faces Vicious out of his own volition. By going to the Syndicate, not only is he protecting Jet and Faye and getting vengeance for Julia, but it also shows that he's finally become liberated by making amends with his past. This was in a way Spike's salvation. He didn't want to die. Even though Julia was gone, a part of him still wanted to live. Despite it taking death to gain amends for his past, he realised he truly was alive this entire time. He never died after escaping the syndicate. He was completely free. And my interpretation of why he was smiling at the end was because, well, it all seemed too good to be true. The fact that he already had everything he wanted in his life to begin with which is what makes the philosophy of its character so tragic and bittersweet. Fucking hell, Sol, that was pretty depressing. Why do you only talk about veggie thing? What am I doing with my life? God, I'm, I'm, fuck, I'm, I'm sorry, okay? I guess to, at the very least, end the video on a silver lining, there are some positive aspects that can be taken from the philosophy of the show. On their journey of self-liberation, they each form valuable connections and end up gaining the necessary catharsis to progress in life. The episodic nature of the show reinforces that it can be easy to enter a sort of trance and go through the repetitive motions of living, just like the Bebop crew did, even though you aren't really feeling alive. The hardships the characters had to endure, such as when Jet killed his ex-partner, when Faye regained her lost memories only to find there's no home waiting for her, and Julia's death, all put things in perspective for the crew, forcing them to reevaluate what they want to do in life and cherish the things they already have. And this mature focus on emotional baggage and closure is why I think the show stands out so much. 
After witnessing 26 sessions of people confronting their pasts and struggles, after the show concludes, the only people left to confront their pasts are us, the viewers. Just like how the Bebop crew observed each bounty face their own personal issues, eventually us, the audience, observed the Bebop crew as individuals doing the same. Can watching these people face their own struggles actually be the catalyst for us as an audience to face up to our own past? As a person who's been deeply impacted by Cowboy Bebop, I think it says that you should aspire to reach that balancing point to where you can accept the regrets of the past and embrace both the good and the bad things in life, to where you wouldn't want anything to be different. Also, don't leave things in the fucking fridge. Have you ever found a dashing piece of weed merchandise, tried to buy it, and then found out, oh, it doesn't even fucking ship to my country. Then you end up manically searching the internet for at least one site that can actually ship the goods to where you live and- Oh, uh, oh, the, 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 the costs are half my fucking bank account for a haunted Asfolio plushie that sucks my dick. <laughs> Basically, the few Japanese shops that do ship overseas will normally include a bank transfer fee, a consolidation fee, an insurance fee, and a bunch of other stuff that just racks up the price to unnecessarily high levels. But with Zen Market, there's literally just the actual price of the item, their cheap service fee of 300 yen, and the shipping costs. So basically, Zen Market is a proxy service that allows you to buy from any online store in Japan, including shops that don't ship abroad or refuse to work with foreign customers. It's a sort of middleman where you can get exclusive Japanese products, specialising in that lovely weeb merch, providing the exclusive anime, manga, toys and figures that you would want, and are literally not available anywhere else, at the cheapest cost possible. If you look at any review of them across the internet, it's always overwhelmingly positive, and it's because they pretty much have the lowest fees, the best customer service, and the best packaging for exclusive Japanese goods. To use it, you can click on the link in the description and create an account. The quickest way is just to use your Google+. Finally, there is a giveaway going on right now where anyone can literally join for free. The top reward includes a Sabre figure from Fate Zero, with second place getting an exclusive Love Life figure, and third and fourth place getting a Zen Pop Japanese item box that includes Japanese snacks and goodies and ramens and stuff like that. If you're interested in this contest, check out the giveaway page in the description. You can join it for free, and if you win, you get these items for completely free, so you might as well try. I'd also like to thank the amazing people who donated on my Patreon, especially Vader1435, Florian Straub, Death the Sage, and most of all H2 Mass, who is a small YouTuber that makes videos analysing anime, movies, television, and a bunch of other content, including occasional comedy videos. He's seriously underappreciated, so I've linked both his channels in the description, and it would mean a lot if you check it out. Also, a massive thank you to Fireshade, who has been the overall most helpful person since I started this channel. He's been in the process of writing a book that I'll link to in the description. It's a pretty interesting read, so I definitely recommend you check it out. If you'd like to support me make more videos, my Patreon, as well as links to my social media are on the screen or in the description somewhere. Thanks for watching, and uh... <laughs>